now here we go. Um, as uh, the laudatoris will still, you know, praise Annegret and, you know, say things about her life. I think I just uh, hand over to Annegret. Here we go. Variation and change, Ephesus and French Creoles. Thanks for talking to us, Annegret. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> I'll try to be not too long. Uh, um, <clears throat> my talk is divided into six uh, parts. Um, um, something. Sorry, I need help. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You have to get rid of this thing, then it works. So okay. It work. okay, thank you, Martin. Yeah. Well, my <clears throat> talk is divided into six parts conversions of simple and prefixed verbs, influence of substrate languages, Ephesus in the old Haitian texts. Ephesus in the Creoles of the Indian Ocean, proposal for an explanation, variation and linguistic change, proposal for <coughs> towards a multi-causal explanation of a complex phenomenon. In the course of compiling the Dictionnaire Etymologique des Creoles Français d'Amérique, we sometimes found simple and prefixed French verbs becoming variants in the different Creoles or within one Creole. Since the meaning of the two verbs was the same or very similar, we have named this phenomenon convergence. See the examples <coughs> we have, <coughs> um, the examples aplanir, planir, becoming aplani or plani, meaning to level, to smooth, apporter and porter, becoming apporter or porter, glossed porter, apporter in the dictionaries. There are about 30 more examples in a detailed version of this study available online. This form of convergence seems particularly interesting in the situation of language contact in which the Creoles emerged. The learners of French perceived formal variation, but either no semantic distinction at all or a slight semantic distinction that seemed of little importance. So they retained only the form without prefix. According to the documentation of Bartbox FEW, these forms were more frequent in colonial French than they are today. And maybe they were already dominant in the approximate varieties of French spoken in the Société d'Habitation in the first decades of settlement. Words like rachi, rachi, chapi, échappé, Crasé, écrasé, voyé, envoyé, are frequent in French based trios. I have counted 130 examples in the letter A of the DECA, 134 in the letter E, and the index of the linguistic atlas of Haiti, the ALH, <clears throat> refers to 94 cases of aphasis on the maps of the atlas. It is therefore surprising that the phenomenon is rarely mentioned in the literature and that the only explanations proposed so far are the loss of an unaccented initial vowel, the generalization of consonantal initials and the tendency towards the unmarked syllable CV preferred in many languages of the word. But if you look up the words indicated by the index of the ALH, you will see that these explanations are not wrong but insufficient because Ephesus also affects words with an initial consonant, for instance, déchiré, redressé, rencontré, refroidissement. One might consider explaining Ephesus in the Creoles by influence of substrate languages. And since it seems to be particularly frequent in Haitian Creole, one could look at the languages having played an important role in the development of Haitian, in the years from 1700 to 1725, when Creole emerged and stabilized in Saint-Domingue. 60% of the slaves arrived from ports of the Bight of Benin, especially Ouida. The majority of them were probably speakers of Bay languages, and certain linguists believe that Haitian is relaxified from Bay. In order to explain Creole Ephesus, I studied the morphological structure of Fong B, as described in the grammar of Hildegard Hilfmann. Mm -hmm. You see on the... Mm -hmm. 
Sorry, sorry on our side. It's okay. Please go ahead. Uh, simple verbs and nouns have the structure CV, par chercher, chi, demurrer, do, dire, ma, donner, j'ai, tombé. What is happening there? So, sorry. Let's continue. Pardon? It's all right. Continue. No, but this is not the right slide. Ah, you, you pressed the wrong button this time. I didn't, I didn't press the button at all. Ah, so then, so this is the right one? So, so look. No, no. Now, let me, let me, let me. No. <laughs> this is not, not, not the one. I need number five. Hmm. Sorry. This is strange. Huh? Number five. This is two. Yeah, this doesn't move for some. Ah, no, this is okay. Sorry move. about that. <laughs> so simple verbs and nouns have the structure CV, but chercher, chi demeurer, do dire, na donner, j'ai tombé, qu'on regarde. I hope that it works now. Yes, it does. Compound verbs and nouns, as well as words formed by reduplication, have the structure CV, CV, chi te se tenir debout, taque, un pro, veto, homme, créature humaine, nya nya, mauvais, zanzan, matin, matiné, and so on for compounds of several constituents CV, 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 CV. Field work, do, father means farmer. My own knowledge of Fong B is very limited and acquired from books, but having worked with the dictionary of Segurola Racinu for several years and studied the grammar of Höfmann, I can ascertain that the basic structures of this language are CV monosyllables, forming either expressions such as those quoted before or lexicalized compounds, some with grammaticalized constituents, such as <clears throat> the, the, the example um, father, which <clears throat> has a with the suffix to meaning father and uh, being also used as an agent noun suffix. I think that possibly speakers of Fong B acquiring French words try to <clears throat> try to retain only syllables with the meaning, and that means lexical morphemes, and for verbs also the endings e and e without meaning, but having the advantage of being preceded by a consonant and permitting the verb to end in a vowel. This reminds us of the perceptual filtering hypothesis <clears throat> formulated by Guy Azaël Massieu. Filtering or selection concerns the pragmatic perceptual and interpretative levels of creolization. The study of perceptual filtering establishes which elements of the phonetic form of linguistic communication were or could be perceived and retained by African slaves when they spoke with their French speaking owners. If we examine the first text written in Haitian Creole, we find arguments to confirm this hypothesis. See the following list of verbs stemming from the French prefix verbs occurring in, passion, in the Passion de Notre Seigneur selon Saint Jean en langage nègre, dated about 1730. Barassé, embarrassé, coutumé, accoutumé, contré, rencontré, tendé, entendé, mandé, demandé, rivé, arrivé, Filé, affilé, cisé, assisé, semblé, rassemblé, maré, amaré, etc., etc. The other important source for the history of Haitian Creole is the Manuel des Habitants de Saint-Domingue of Ducarjoli. 
intended to provide some knowledge of Creole for colonists planning to settle in Saint-Domingue in the form of conversations and French <clears throat> and the French uh, Creole glossary of 72 pages. Apparently, the author had very precise ideas about the structures of regular Creole. All French verbs beginning with A or E appear without prefix, for instance, cheminé, <clears throat> mari, mené, monceli, borné, cali, carté. As for nouns, the CV syllable structure is obtained by agglutination, normally of the plural ending of French article or demonstratives, zaccident, zaction, zaffaire, zami, zanana. The two texts give the impression that aphasis occurs for all verbs that have a prefix that seems semantically neglig negligible. This does not hold for dérivé and débattre, which keep their prefix. Actually, if you look at the French verbs with the prefix a and e listed in the Deca, <clears throat> you will see that they are all uh, without, their, they, they all lose their prefix. This is not the case for dérivé and uh, déchiré, they keep their prefix, and actually dé and ré are still pre productive prefixes in all French creoles today. The old Haitian texts would confirm my hypothesis that attributes the loss of the initial unstressed syllable to the influence of B languages, but this explanation is problematic in so far as Ephesus is also observed in all the creoles of the Indian Ocean. The island of, no, sorry, this is from Vida Farge. Maybe I pressed two, twice, I'm yeah. sorry. <laughs> it doesn't work immediately, so you have to press and just wait. I'm, I'm sorry about that. <laughs> no worries, Anneke, no worries. So um, the island of La Réunion was colonized from 1665 onwards. Many of the first French settlers had Malagasy servants or spouses. Others married young women, Métis and the Portuguese, brought from India. The slave trade from Madagascar and East Africa began in 1697. And it was not until 1717 that the slaves began to outnumber the free population. The demographic development in the decades 1725 to 35 reflects the transition from the Société d'Habitation to the Société de Plantation following the introduction of coffee planting around 1725. This is when Reunion Creole emerged. Mauritius was abandoned by the Dutch in 1709 and occupied in 1721 by the French, who named it Ile de France. The beginnings of the colony were very difficult. The first habitations were established with soldiers and young women brought from France who were given land and slaves. When, uh, slaves were shipped from West Africa Madagascar and India, and skilled workers from Pondicherry. Until about 1760, Madagascar was the main source of slaves for Ile de France and Bourbon, but slaves from East Africa, speaking Bantu languages, had begun to be introduced by 1736, and their proportion slowly increased until they overtook Malagasy arrivals decisively in about 1765. The Seychelles were settled in 1770, mainly from Mauritius, but also from Réunion. The French settlers brought the slaves and the Creole along with them to the new subcolony. In Mauritius, West African languages, especially Wolof, might have played a certain role in the first years of settlement from 1727 to 35. Concerning Wolof, Jürgen Lang notes that it has no words with unstressed initial vowels, and that the speakers of Wolof, who contributed to the Capverdian Creole of Santiago,
avoided Portuguese words with unstressed initial vowels. He quotes the following examples from his Dictionario do Criolo da Ilha de Santiago. Abraça, braça, assento, assento, abobora, abobra, acaba, acaba, elefante, elefante. This is Water. That there were also speakers of Pei languages in Mauritius is possible but unlikely. The structures of Malagasy do not offer any ground for the substrate hypothesis, and the slaves from East Africa are also irrelevant in this context. Bantu languages are characterized by a system of class prefixes, so their speakers would not have been inclined to neglect prefixes. Morris Goodwin has given a brief description of the phenomenon. The loss of the initial vowel in some of the above forms is a characteristic development of verbs throughout Creole, though somewhat more widespread in American than in Mauritian Creole. Some further examples are blié, oublié, couté, écouté, marie, American Creole, but amari, Mauritius. The initial syllables de, re, of verbs are also occasionally lost in Creole. However, Goodman did not try to explain it. The aim of his comparative study of Creole French dialects was to postulate a West African pidgin with certain features of West African languages, but he did not mention possible substrate inference in this case. So we have to look for another explanation if we think that Ephesus calls for an explanation. I've discussed the question with Elisa Pustka and Michel de Graaf. They both observed that the examples submitted to them show a tendency towards two syllable words. And Elisa Pustka points out that they are less marked ones in children's language. So a universal tendency might have played a role. Although perfectly plausible, this explanation is insufficient because, <clears throat> because it does not explain why Ephesus affects mainly verbs and also verbs of which more than two syllables remain, abandonné, embarrassé, accoutumé, etc. My impression is that the cases of Ephesus discussed so far have to be analyzed in connection with the morphological structures of French, the meaning of certain prefixes and prefixed verbs, and very likely the cases of convergence mentioned at the beginning of this talk. This is, impression is akin to the analysis of certain Mauritian verbs by Charles Bezac. He speaks of verbe composé, compound verbs. I quote in my translation. From tenir, French has formed or received from Latin retenir, contenir, detenir, maintenir, soutenir, etc. Likewise, from tourner, it has derived détourner, retourner, contourner, etc. The Creole speaker does not retain the compound unless the meaning is so distant from the simple verb that its use would make the sentence incomprehensible. He will say, fonce la porte, enfonce la porte, n'a pas fonce mon chapeau, ne défonce pas mon chapeau, me poser, je me repose, une dame jantine, huit bouteilles, une dame jante contient huit bouteilles, les fins levées, il s'est relevé. Even some simple verbs undergo this emphasis of the first syllable, imaginer, masiner, écumer, quimer, étourdir, tourdi, attacher, tasser, etc. I think the development of Ephesus should be considered in the context of the two phases of creolization. We know very little about the approximate French which developed in the Société d'Habitation. Perhaps it is helpful to look at a variety of North American French, Louisiana French for some clues. 
going through the letters A and E of the Dictionary of Louisiana French, the DLF, I found 19 cases of aphasis or convergence between Abatardi and Amacorné, and 34 cases between Ebaroui and Embouteillé, with one exception, a variation of simple and prefixed verb. What I found particularly interesting was the frequent occurrence of two or three synonym verbs. Achalé, enchalé, to overheat, accuré, écuré, encuré, to nauseate, affilé, enfilé, effilé, to sharpen, aonté, enté, éonté, to, <coughs> to shame, allongé, élongé, to lengthen, extend. Let us imagine an African girl who is assigned to domestic work. She joins slaves in the courtyard plucking chickens. One of them says, déplumé, another one, éplumé, and the third one, plumé. All three verbs are attested in the DLF with the meaning to pluck feathers from. Which variant will she retain? Very likely, plumé, which becomes Haitian, Haitian plumé. Still, it should be noted that in this case, variation is maintained up to the 20th century. Map 1299 shows Plumain at 13 points and De Plumain at five points. Probably the many cases of convergence in colonial French have contributed to considerable, considerable variation, even more remarkable than what we observed in contemporary Louisiana French, and these convergences have triggered the selection of simple variants. Yet another factor. No. No, this is correct. So let's see. This is correct. Yet another has to be factor has to be taken into account variation in non-standard or regional French. It is well known that Creoles did not develop from the modern standard French, but from the speech of the settlers, which was characterized by regional features. An example in, is the emphasis of imaginé, attributed to the Creoles by Bessac, but in fact, the Creole forms are inherited in FEW, Maginé instead of Imaginé is attested in Normandy and, and in not. It can be assumed that in many cases, the simple forms became dominant in approximate French, and that this tendency increased in the second phase in the Société de Plantation, when Creoles emerged from the approximate varieties of French, the learners having quickly found out that it was sufficient to retain the simple variant. This led to the spread of emphasis to words especially verbs without previous variation in French. Verbs which cannot be analyzed as prefixed in French, abîmer, demander, échouer, éclater, écarter, <coughs> écouter, entendre, envoyer, etc. Verbs with opaque prefixes, affûter, attacher, attaquer, avaler, déchirer, écorcher, écraser, oublier, Verbs with E or en, the meaning of the prefix being not clear, éclairé, élevé, endommagé, and words in, with a prefix that seems redundant, emplacement, endommagé, éborné, rendre bon. Towards a multi-causal explanation of a complex phenomenon. The Réunionnais examples quoted by Chaudençon show that there are different kinds of aphasis. I propose distinguishing the following types. First, romance, romance aphases. Ty this type occurs in many romance languages, especially Romanian and Italian. It is due to deglutination of an article. For instance, Italian, la Puglia, le Puglie from Apulia. And among the Creole examples of this Sorry, I unmuted Annegret, sorry. Sorry, can you please, Martin, could you please uh, go back? Sorry. 
I apologize. I had twice, I had, I had unmuted a person who has always muted himself, herself again. So I overreacted, sorry. Not so easy. Nein. Das ist perfekt. Sorry so much, Annegret. Es tut mir echt leid. Ich sitze hier. Sorry. The multi-causal explanation of a complex phenomenon. Um, a first type is romance aphasies. Um, and this type occurs made in many romance languages, especially Romanian and Italian, is due to deep rutination of an article. For instance, Italian La Puglia, Le Puglie from Apulia. Among the Creole examples of this type, there is a term belonging to the vocabulaire d'Isil, showing variation uh, still today. Habitation, becoming habitation or habitation in Haitian, estate, large landholding, ancestral land. And St. Lucian, l'habitation, plant, plantation, residence, habitation, plantation, estate, countryside. In the Indian Ocean Creoles, Sorry. Um, L'habitation or habitation, meaning today in Mauritius, dwellings built on land belong to a sugar industry and habitation in the Seychelles, vegetable gardens. Further examples are alambic, lambic, alliance, liance, arrowroot, root, etc. Secondly, aphasies of mot savant. Many shortenings concern technical terms in the fields of medicine, botany, or zoology. The aphetic variants may be inherited. Uh, that's the case of erisipel becoming resipel. And uh, other examples are acacia, cassia, cassi, alcricange, seychellois, quinquance, azalea, azali, zalia, zali, veloutier, loutier. Thirdly, words which continue French variants. Etouffé, touffé is already attested in Normandy and pont aux mer touffé. And fourthly, Creole aphasies. This is, of course, the most interesting type due to the language contact situation in which second language learners confronted with the variation of simple and prefix verbs as described before, preferred the simple forms, probably already dominant in the approximate French spoken by the Creoles in the plantation society. That unstressed initials were dropped happened also in the history of English. See examples quoted by Otto Jespersen in his modern English grammar, um, amend, mend, apprentice, prentice, and withdrawing room becoming drawing room. Jesperson thinks that aphasies are probably nowhere quite so numerous as in present day English. And he concludes his observation with this remark. I end here by saying that these shortenings on the whole have made and are making for progress in linguistic efficiency. The short, crisp, energetic forms are easier to handle than the original long and cumbersome ones in which much was really superfluous for the purpose of being understood by others. It can be assumed, sorry, no. This sounds, this quotation, sounds like an accurate description of what happened in the process of Creole genesis on the plantations in the French colonies. The allogloths preferred the forms without superfluous syllables and retained the short forms perfectly adapted for communication. And the reason for this choice was not only their meaning. Maria Selig pointed out that pretonic initial syllables are generally not well perceived. And the tendency to prefer two syllable words mentioned by Elisa Kuska and Michel de Graaf also seems to play a role in situations of language context. This is confirmed by Bernd Heine's study of pidgin Sprachen in Bantu Bereich. He gives figures for Fanagalo and pidgin Swahili compared to their base languages, Zulu and standard Swahili, showing an increase in the percentage of two syllable words. 
As I've said before, words which have undergone emphasis are numerous in the dictionaries, but they are also frequent in Creole texts. When reading a text written in Haitian or Antillean Creole, a Francophone reader is struck by the verbs such as plier, garder, contrer, coûter, craser, mander, marrer, parer, porter, racher, ranger, river, sayer, tendez, voyer, etc., which make Creole look very different from French. The same cannot be said of modern Creoles in the Indian Ocean. A systematic comparison reveals differences as to the number of words in the dictionaries and to the types and tokens in texts. How can these differences be explained? If my assumption is correct that the emphases, being sporadic linguistic change, came about when L2 learners in the plantation societies acquired approximate French, it seems possible, perhaps probable, that their selection of variants without unstressed initial vowels or syllables was reinforced by their native languages. In the Indian Ocean, only the development of French verbal morphology and the selection of variants without prefixes or initial unstressed vowel syllables by L2 learners happened. But in the Caribbean, I imagine there was convergence of these developments and substrate influence. I don't know whether you find that convincing, but at least it's a hypothesis to be discussed. Thank you for your attention. Um, I want to point out that, um, uh, but this is well known, that there were many speakers of B languages and Wolof in the Caribbean and in the Indian Ocean. This was not the case. So the uh, possible influence of West African languages in the Caribbean can be uh, historically um, made plausible. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much, Annegret. <laughs> Sorry about the inconveniences caused. <laughs> no, but also my side. But I think we did. You, you did great, and also Martin, you've done your best. But I have. I was not at all familiar with this, with this machinery. <laughs> we should look at uh, Martin, könntest du das scheren bitte aufhören? Martin hat. Sorry. <laughs> and, and, and you, you know that uh, I'm, uh, I'm retired in principle and <laughs> yeah. not only in principle, no. So thanks so much. I, and you were perfect, you're perfectly in time. So I open the discussion. We have 10 minutes of time to uh, discuss this interesting paper by Annegret. So please get your, use the unique chance to talk to Annegret about um, these interesting uh, phenomena. Are there any questions? Uh, yeah, Ralf Ludwig, please. Unmute yourself, please. Well, I, I can try to ask my question in, in English. No, 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 sorry, sorry. You can go ahead in French. That's something. We uh, will have okay. a... Yeah, as, please, as, please, as you please prefer. Uh, well, uh, anyway, I will speak principally of French. So, uh, en français, uh, je veux dire, j'ai ai beaucoup aimé intégrer ton, ton approche multifactorielle, multicausale, et je pense que c'est vraiment, vraiment, vraiment le la voie à, à suivre. J'ai pensé euh, à une phrase de Hugo Schuchard que nous avons citée récemment euh, avec Civil. Euh, et Stéphane, euh, qui a dit « Pourquoi toujours répondre en disant euh, « either or euh, ?» Pourquoi pas, Il a dit « Moi, je préfère, et c'est le vieux Choura qui le dit, je, je, dans les explications, je préfère répondre euh, ceci et aussi cela. » Voilà. Euh, « Sowohl als auch. » Oui. Euh, donc, euh, ce qui me vient à l'esprit, je, je n'y connais rien en phonologie et je n'y connais rien en, en langues africaines, principalement. Mais euh, il y a une différence marquée entre le, le créole 
entre l'articulation créole et l'articulation française en Guadeloupe. Je parle uniquement pour le Guadeloupéen. C'est-à-dire qu'en Guadeloupéen, lorsqu'on veut mettre un accent euh, emphatique sur un mot, on met l'accent sur la première voyelle. Si l'on l'a raché, puis voilà. Hein? Alors qu'en français, on va accentuer davantage la dernière voyelle. Il a arraché cet arbre. Voilà. Et ça, cela fonctionne très, très mal euh, si, euh, si une, euh, un mot commence par une, euh, une voyelle. Donc, ce serait euh, effectivement eu un petit facteur parmi d'autres euh, pour, euh, pour cette évolution, euh, euh, pour le, le fait de, donc, en fait, euh, d'éliminer une, une seule voyelle initiale. Et, et éventuellement, on peut se poser la question si cette tendance à déplacer par rapport au français cet accent emphatique au début du mot, si ça, ce n'est pas dû à une influence substratique. Parce que ça, je ne le connais pas du français. Donc, explication substratique, mais disons par l'arrière-porte. Oui, mais l'accent n'est pas sur le premier, le premier, euh, la première voyelle parce que euh, ça serait le préfixe, n'est-ce pas? Parce que la première voyelle des mots dont je parle, c'est des préfixés, n'est-ce pas? Euh, mm. Il faut expliquer, c'est les, les affaires Les affaires oui, 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 mais tu, si tu dis « y rivait » et tu ne pourrais pas faire ça si c'était « arrivé ». Arriver, non. Tu dis arriver, joli là. Alors, bon, j'ai insisté sur le fait qu'on qu qu garde la première syllabe qui a un sens. Oui. Arriver n'a pas de sens, n'est-ce pas? On peut s'en passer selon les, 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 les locuteurs du substrat, parce que les locuteurs du substrat euh, ont le, connaissent les, les, ont des, des mots qui, qui ont des, des syllabes euh, CV, n'est-ce pas, euh, qui ont un sens. Et il n'y a rien avant. Donc, tout ce qui est avant la, la syllabe qui porte le sens est pour eux superflu et euh, on, on s'en passe. Je ne pense pas qu'il y ait de, une contradiction. Bon, c'est une. Sorry, je ne vais pas I'm du tout mesurer. Uh... Anne-Gay, entschuldigung, I, I'm sorry. We just cut it here because we have another five minutes and there are two other, other people who want to intervene. We may stay in line afterwards. A very interesting topic and come back to this. So it's Viviane now who, is, uh, who has her question. Yes, actually, rather than a question, it's a comment. I really love your explanation, and I think it's wonderful. And it um, provides a very good argument against the general view that a simplification in the syllable having a CVCV -CV sequence is childlike. So I, I like that. It might be one factor, but... Um, that was also used, you know, to uh, think that Creoles were simpler and infantile languages. And you provided a wonderful uh, reason why this explanation is not sufficient. So thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Sally, Coco, Sally, please go ahead. Thank you, Anne for this wonderful presentation. I just want to react to Rap Ludwig's uh, comment. Um, you know, thinking of substrate influence is uh, an easy way, but the substrate languages are generally, in this case, uh, tonal languages, and the place of the high tone varies from one word to another, and that doesn't match the kind of regularity that you find in, uh, say, Martinique or uh, in this particular case. And a person that drew my attention to this was the late Francis, Francis Joannet, who pointed out to me that one of the differences between my French and that of my uh, Antillean colleagues was the fact that there seemed to be two stresses in long words. And I don't know where it came from, but I wouldn't attribute that to some great influence.
Um, sorry, I still hear some background noise. I'm sorry, I, I, I went along back and forth. Everyone is muted, right? Um, Sally, sorry, I, I couldn't listen. C could someone resume maybe the question for Annegret? Because uh, Sally, you, it's difficult to understand you, at least for me. Could... Oh, okay, he may have background, but I, I generally think that I had difficulties to understand him already throughout the conference. So is there anyone, or he can repeat it to me? I, I wasn't- Yeah, I, I was saying that the, uh, trying to explain what is going on in the Caribbean by substrate influence doesn't work because a substrate influence, uh, substrate languages are generally tonal. And the high tone, which is the closest thing that's to stress in European languages, this position varies from one word to another. It wouldn't really match the kind of regularity in the two stress system that you find in Antillean French. And I invoke Francis Joanne because he's the person that brought my, do, do this to my attention. Uh, it, it was in Cayenne in 1989, a few months before he died, but that's something that I really remember. So, I mean, it's just a word of caution, just because it is not like in French, <laughs> does not necessarily mean that it came from the Southwest language. Okay, thank you. <laughs> So is, is there any other question, comment from the floor? I, yes, Clancy, please go ahead. Uh, just a comment from, uh, from the Portuguese, the Asian Portuguese side. So um, what you say about the Société de Habitation and then going into the Société de Plantation, uh, in the, in, India, for example, there was only the, the first. And the, 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 L2s, uh, the, the L2 learners who were learning some variety of Portuguese, they, they were, there was only one language involved that was the substrate language. And so you have basically two language contact situations. And the, these, where you would expect if it were say Haitian or were some West African Creole, where you would expect a, th a three syllable to a two syllable, especially if it begins with a, um, uh, with a vowel, you get some of that in verbs like akabar is kaba. But if, the, if it's three syllables and, and there's, so um, uh, for example, to, uh, there are, there are some three syllable words that keep the three syllables and then they shift the, they, they shift the stress assignment to the penult instead of the, the uh, ultimate stress. So uh, basically since, since you, you don't have Bantu languages involved or uh, a very strong pattern of CV structure uh, and you have inflectional languages interacting with inflectional languages, you get a lot of retained uh, uh, trisyllabic verbs, and uh, which is what you might expect uh, given the substrate languages and the interaction between two Indo-European or Indo -European languages. Just a comment. Thank you. <laughs> So thank you very much uh, all together. I think, is there any further question? I think we will continue with our, oh, Sally, is it a second question that you still have or your hand is still risen? Would you like to ask a second question, Sally? You're muted, you're muted, you're still muted. Yes, I'm sorry. I thought I had lowered my hand all the Okay, okay. So I would like to start. Uh, now we have um, three colleagues and myself to um, praise Annegate, so to speak. I could have asked many other people. I chose these three ones, and uh, the next time we will choose others. No, but, you know, I'm uh, very grateful to my colleagues who, um, who are willing to... Um, 
yeah, to do the, the praisal with me. So I start out uh, with my little praisal, Annegret. And now I have to check that I, I try to do this and it doesn't function okay. Um, uh, you are sharing the screen and I would like to have a full screen, but I cannot go. If that's the case, then that's the case. Oh, here we go. Okay, so dear Annegret, um, I just want to mention a few items of your vita, which may be relevant here. You did your PhD or you got your PhD from Bonn University in 69 with a dissertation on the Latin de-verbal nouns of the OU declination and their transformations in romance. You uh, hold held two tenure track positions, uh, one in, at the University of Bonn and the other in Köln University between 69 and 78. And you got your habilitation in 60, um, in 76, with two books on Creole languages. So Le Creole Français des Seychelles, and uh, on the origin of the French Creole dialects in Indian Ocean, Creolization without pigeonization. Bettina cited it already. And with this, you're certainly the pioneer of German Creole studies. Then in 78, you got the chair for Romance Linguistics and Medieval Studies at Bamberg University. So where is Bamberg? It's not far from Nuremberg in the north. It's the northern part of Bavaria. And as you can see, it's in the middle of Germany and at the heart of Europe. And when you, if you haven't been to Bamberg, you must go there. It's one of the most beautiful cities imaginable. It's UNESCO World Heritage. And uh, the university is not far from this place that you can see the little, it's, it's beautiful little river going through Bamberg and the, and the fantastic dome cathedral, medieval cathedral. Um, you had your chair, you were retired in 2002 and you were honored as Emerita of Excellence by Bamberg University in 2014. And we will see why that was the case. So you got your uh, uh, chair, that is the chair of Romance uh, Linguistics at Bamberg and so for all people outside of German speaking area, Romance Linguistics is, is actually a strange uh, denomination. It's a German invention going back to the late 18th century. So what does it mean? As a German Romance linguist, you must become a comparative linguist because you have 15 Romance languages there you know, to study and to talk about and to teach. And that's what Annegret has become from very early on. As the department, the Bamberg department of Romans linguistics has been quite small, Annegret delivered lectures for students studying any Romans language, French, Italian, Spanish, Portuguese. So, but not only introduction to French linguistics, Italian linguistics, Spanish linguistics, Portuguese linguistics, but also introduction to the medieval literature of each language. So intro, introduction to La Chanson de Roland, La Divina Commedia, El Canto del Mirti. This man has become very influential in Annegret's life and therefore also in Creole studies. This is Walter von Wartburg, the most famous Swiss Romance linguist. Actually, he spent also 10 years at Leipzig University where I'm based right now. What did he do? He wrote the Französisches Etymologisches Wörterbuch, F-E-V, and I'm not going to translate this. This is going to be F-E-V, even in my English, because it's such an um, emblematic, lexicalized word for me. So the French Etymological Dictionary, 25 volumes, 160 fascicles, and more than 17,000 pages. I think that Annegret, most of these pages, uh, she knows, knows by heart. And you could already tell in her talk, and... Uh, this is the, the, the real proof. If you see the sister publications, the Dictionnaire Etymologique des Créoles Français de l'Océan Indien and the Dictionnaire Etymologique des Créoles Français d'Amérique, both four volumes. And now you see when they were published, the official re retirement was 2002. Many people, you know, go then to whatever Florida or to Mallorca or whatever and, you know, spend their years you know, I don't know what, doing what, but not be working anymore. And for Annegret, it was just the other way around. She just started to produce the, her big, big um, volumes and works, linguistic works, which were so influential and will stay influential for Creole studies. So as a result of the detailed knowledge of the FEV, Annegret developed a unique comparatively informed view of French overseas varieties and French-based Creoles. 
this is the best position ever to judge whether a given word construction or construction, any French Creole may have a peril in French overseas variety or in any other dialectal variety of metropolitan France or in any other old or middle French variety. So she has all the dimensions just in front of her. This is unique, Annegret. Now, uh, you have delivered a multifaceted oeuvre and I, it's impossible. I just touch on four or five topics here. It's language planning. Bettina had this already with your dear late friend, Daniel Dauphé de Saint-Georges. You uh, worked on a spelling system for the Seychelles. You had early on the article, the role of convergence during realization. So nearly 40 years ago, when others, you know, came with this concept only, you know, lately, let's put it like this. You edited old texts, um, Fab de la Fontaine, and you also edited corpus of spoken texts with your dear, dear late uh, friend and colleague, Marcel Rosalie, Parole et Mémoire, uh, a wonderful um, work of uh, uh, spoken uh, texts in Seychelles Creole. And then finally, I mean, you were even, what's your age now? 84, I guess. So you can see in, in 2013, you were there and you worked on grammar and socio-historical and sociolinguistic uh, things for, uh, when doing the structured data set for, and survey for uh, Reunion Creole for Apex. Now you are, you have always been a wonderful team player. And here are just, you know, people out of the top of, from top of my head that I've put here, many, many others would fit, but you can see Ingrid norman Holschu, your famous student, now also retired from uh, Regensburg University working on Louisiana Creole and uh, Philip Baker, your late colleague, Dominique Fatier, Zébile Kriegel, Jean-Paul um, and so forth, your dear late husband, Willem Bollet, and uh, voila, and many, many others, Evelyn Wiesinger, who organized a workshop here at the, at the conference. So at the end, a very short personal note. Actually, I got to know you long before I got you to know you personally via this introduction to French linguistics. In my first semester at Bonn University, 81, we had the so-called Pertas Bollet. And sometimes I thought it was like Pertas was the first name and, you know, and this Boulet was the name, Pertas Boulet, your, your colleague, uh, Willem Pertas and your maiden name, Alstor Boulet. Beautiful Grundkurs and I can still, you know, this is the seventh edition I think I have here. I don't know how many editions it has seen, many, many, many more. And it was so useful and it brought me at, into uh, 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 romance linguistic first. But then when I did my master thesis in 86, I met you personally and you were so generous uh, sharing your material, Seychel Creole, with me. This was for me as a young master student, unbelievable that a person like you would be so, you know, normal, uh, down to earth and just so helpful. And then we had the first trip together to the Seychelles in 89. And then I had the wonderful time with you at your department from 91 to 98. So, dear Annegret, um, now I have to rely some, on, on some written stuff here. I don't use superlatives often, and I'm not that person to use them often, but here I have to say, you have been the most generous person I have come across in my life. So, first of all, generosity of uh, spirit, uh, sharing your time, your linguistic ideas, your linguistic material, your humor, your love, your financial support for so many people around you who really needed it. I've never come across a person who would just give away what you have and sharing it with, with the ones needed who need it around you. You shared your car with me when I came to Bamek. The first thing as a young, you know, tenure check position person, you said, oh, you know, by the way, this is my car. You just take it when you need it. And I was like, I take your car. Yeah, you know, well, you know, I don't need it so often. So it's better we, we share it. So long before there was car sharing, you did it. And that's what you were, always ahead of your time, way ahead of your time, always the person, um, yeah, to be uh, uh, totally at the total disposal of the other. So um, you are, you have been a shining model for all of us, not only for women in uh, in career studies and in, in uh, academic careers, but also on a personal level, I'm very, very grateful to you. And um, that's um, the end of my little praise. Thank you so much, dear Annegret. Thank you so much, Suzanne. So we have three others to come and I'm very happy to give the floor to Zibille. Here you go, Zabella. You must be already shared. Can you share your screen?
Yes, perfect, Sibylle. You have to unmute yourself, Sibylle. Sibylle? I can't hear you. Okay, now I think that everybody can hear me, even if I speak French, I'm sorry. <laughs> I said, no, 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 sorry for speaking yeah. French. This was a Paris conference, so I'm very happy to have some French input here. So, um, donc je passe au français. Je um, connais Anne-Grette Bollet depuis septembre uh, 1988. Uh, et elle a accompagné toutes mes étapes, uh, toutes les étapes de ma vie de, de criolliste. Je l'ai vue pour la première fois il y a donc 33 ans. Je l'ai vue de loin, il faut l'avouer, parce que je n'osais pas lui adresser la parole à l'époque. C'était lors d'un colloque organisé euh, à l'université de Freiburg en Allemagne où je commençais à suivre mes premiers cours euh, sur les créoles. La grande Madame Bollet euh, parlait du développement du créole écrit au Seychelles. Et un petit passage sur la forme verbale « gagne » du verbe français « gagner » aura été euh, décisif pour mon parcours euh, de créoliste. Euh, là, je cite euh, l'article qui a été publié après. « D'un emploi très rare dans les contes populaires, cette forme semble être sur le point de se grammaticaliser dans le créole écrit actuel. » Voilà. Euh, le sujet pour ma thèse de doctorat a été euh, trouvé. Et je suis sûre euh, que je ne suis pas la seule à devoir ce pas euh, décisif vers la recherche à euh, Annegret. Une première antenne à Regensburg avec Ingrid Neumann-Holzschuld, qui d'ailleurs s'excuse, elle vient de m'écrire un SMS pour dire qu'elle ne peut pas se connecter, mais elle pense très fort à nous. Ensuite, l'équipe fribourgeoise autour de Ralph Ludwig, qui est bien sûr Susanne Michaelis, Susanne qui allait s'installer après à Bamberg avant d'arriver au Max Planck de Leipzig. Et on pourrait, on peut évidemment prolonger cette liste pour arriver à la troisième génération des petits-enfants spirituels danne Grip qui sont aujourd'hui très actifs dans le monde des études créoles, comme on le voit ici dans cette conférence, n'est-ce pas, Evelyne donc, euh, bien sûr, il va sans dire qu'à cette époque, 19, euh, 1988, euh, Annegret était déjà euh, une instance incontournable de la créolistique européenne et internationale. Euh, lors des colloques du euh, Comité international des études créoles, euh, mais aussi lors d'autres conférences, elle a participé... Euh, aux discussions controverses entre Robert Chauvençon, Philippe Baker, Albert Waldman et euh, de Chris Korn, pour euh, n'en nommer que quelques-uns des protagonistes de cette première euh, génération. Et plus d'une fois, ton autorité, euh, Anne-Gré, ton autorité incontestée, t'a valu de te retrouver dans le rôle euh, très délicat de, de pacificatrice, de, de casque bleu euh, des études créoles. Le fait que tu sois une des rares femmes de cette génération de chercheurs mérite d'être examiné de plus près aussi. Une femme et par-dessus tout allemande, donc un pays à l'époque, à l'époque je dis bien, peu connu pour son exemplarité en matière d'égalité entre les genres. Pourquoi euh, Une phrase euh, de euh, la bouche d'Angrid m'a profondément marquée. Je l'appellerai la recette de sorcière, non pas de la créolisation, comme le propose Robert Chauvençon, mais la recette de sorcière permettant de faire la carrière que tu as faite tout en étant femme née en 1937. Tu as donné euh, les ingrédients suivants. Être fille d'un professeur d'université, pour ne pas avoir peur des profs. Être protestante et être l'aîné d'une fratrie avec deux petits frères euh, à dominer. Il est fort possible que ces ingrédients euh, aient peut-être contribué à ton ascension, euh, mais nous le savons tous, euh, ce n'est pas tout. Et aujourd'hui, les temps ont changé, et les élèves pour qui euh, tu as été et pour qui tu es toujours un modèle ne doivent plus euh, cocher ces trois euh, cases-là. J'y reviendrai tout de suite. 
Permettez-moi maintenant de me concentrer sur les dix dernières années et de vous parler de quatre missions mémorables aux Seychelles que j'ai eu la chance de faire en compagnie d'Anne Gret. Et cela me permettra de compléter la recette de sorcière. Qu'est-ce qu'il faut Il faut avoir à sa disposition une bibliothèque, une bonne bibliothèque, comme c'est le cas par exemple euh, de la Créolische Bibliothek, collection euh, dirigée par euh, Anne Gret jusqu'à très récemment. Maintenant, euh, Evelyn Wiesinger, Ingrid Neumann et Ralf Ludwig euh, s'en occupent. Il faut aussi écrire du matin au soir. Du matin au soir pour arriver à ce résultat. Et il ne faut surtout jamais s'arrêter. Là, vous ne voyez que trois des huit tomes, euh, des huit volumes euh, du euh, dictionnaire euh, étymologique euh, dont, déjà, euh, dont Suzanne a déjà euh, parlé. Il ne faut jamais s'arrêter euh, jusqu'au jour de la publication. Là, vous voyez Anne Gret en compagnie de Ingrid Neumann Holzschuh en 2018 euh, avec... Euh, de, des tomes euh, du dictionnaire étymologique. Il faut aussi choisir les bonnes équipes. Là, euh, euh, Daniel de Saint-Georges, euh, euh, ta grande amie séchelloise, euh, avec qui tu as euh, fait entre autres l'orthographe euh, pour les Seychelles, la première, Guy Lyonnais, euh, le dictionnaire euh, euh, du créole séchellois. Et ensuite, beaucoup plus tard, euh, une séance de travail avec euh, Marcel euh, Rosalie, notre regretté euh, ami. Là, nous avons une, une séance de book launching euh, en 2014. C'était le livre Parole et Mémoire, euh, qui, euh, euh, donc, euh, c'était une séance préparée par Penda Chopi et elle est euh, en train de parler euh, linguistique avec Penda. Il faut aussi choisir les bons endroits pour travailler. Ce n'est pas, euh, de, je pense que vous êtes d'accord avec moi, que ce n'est pas désagréable de travailler, euh, par exemple, dans cette grande salle du, de l'Institut Créole International aux Seychelles. Il faut savoir parler, mais il faut aussi savoir écouter, ce qui est toujours le cas euh, d'Anne Gret. Il faut euh, ne pas craindre la célébrité, c'est très important. Euh, euh, là, vous voyez Anne Gret euh, lors de l'enregistrement d'une émission, émission de Radio Seychelles en 2017. Là, euh, c'est la une du quotidien séchellois euh, The Nation. Euh, c'est une cérémonie euh, de remerciement qui a été organisée pour Anne Gret en 2017 aux Seychelles. Euh, et là, vous voyez euh, en train d'enregistrer euh, dans un décor tout à fait euh, agréable une émission de, euh, pour la euh, Seychelles Broadcasting euh, euh, Corporation. Il faut aussi, et ce n'est pas un détail, savoir conduire à gauche. <rire> là, vous voyez Anne Gret dans cette voiture, là, euh, au volant. Euh, il faut euh, savoir euh, que euh, il faut surtout savoir euh, ne, il faut ne pas confondre l'essuie-glace et le clignotant, un facteur de survie aux Seychelles. Il faut aussi savoir euh, apprécier les bains de mer à 29 degrés. Là, vous voyez Anne Gret, euh, après une journée de travail, à pointe au sel, euh, prendre son bain du soir. Il faut aussi euh, savoir ce qu'on fait après, ce qui, faut savoir ce qui fait du bien le soir. Euh, là, vous avez un, euh, une boisson tout à fait séchelloise, c'est euh, du tonic water, mais il vaut mieux ajouter autre chose. Euh, voilà, ça c'est le fameux gin marrant, euh, euh, un breuvage inventé par euh, Anne Gret Bollet et Ingrid Neumann. Et voilà, pour terminer, il faut savoir tout simplement profi savoir profiter des bons moments. Euh, et euh, anne Gret, nous voulons tous te remercier pour tout ce que tu fais et ce que tu as fait pour nous. Merci. Oui, merci Isabelle. Merci beaucoup. Alors, c'était moi déjà, pardon de le dire. Est-ce que tu peux t'arrêter voilà, de chez, chez Ascreen
faire quand est-ce que je peux faire ouais c'est en bas euh, mmh. voilà où c'est ah, je sais pas oh là là tu sais en bas je crois c'est en bas euh, en il vert il faut aller tout en bas euh, Sibylle ah oui voilà 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 Zupa, thank, thanks so much, Sibylle. Oh, great. So we have a third, a third colleague uh, going to praise uh, uh, Annegret. It's Sally Mufwene. Please share your screen or whatever, or just speak whatever you have prepared. I will just speak. Um, I thought I would be quite informal. Um, I have less information on Annegret than uh, the two of you, uh, Sibyl and Suzanne, have, and um, I, I and I'm glad I can speak in English, not because I cannot speak French, but because I was debating whether I should tutoie or vouvoyer and agree, and I can avoid the problem now. Um, I met and agree for the first time um, in 1986 uh, in Réunion. And uh, it was, uh, you know, I, I don't see a challenge in people, and I got in a confrontation with Robert Chedanson, who ultimately became a very good friend of mine. But Anegre heard me talk about marketness. And at the end of the conference, she came, at the, after my session sometime, she came and spoke privately to me and said, I think there is a German guy who works on um, marketingness, and you should know his work. His name is Maya Kale. And he had a small book, you know, yeah. written by Maya Kale and was very kind uh -huh. to send it to me later on. And uh, it helped me think about marketingness in a more thorough way than I was doing at that time. And then um, uh, on another occasion, I don't remember what it was in Mauritius or in uh, Cayenne, I was talking about the behavior of the noun in French wheels and was particularly intrigued by the presence of their nouns in uh, the use of their nouns in uh, French wheels on the model um, similar to English. And uh, my approach uh, was, um, my account was, you know, a whole lot of these things um, were inherited from the lexus by a million years. So uh, many signs of influence, uh, substrate influence. And again, Anegre talked to me after my uh, paper and um, uh, said, I think you should learn more about the instability of the article in French in the 18th century. And there is a publication that you should read and you sent me that publication. And thanks to that publication, I started paying more attention to how the article is used in French. And indeed, even in modern French, there are cases of their nouns, especially in official documents where there are enumeration and so forth that uh, uh, are quite striking. So it's not a word of caution so that you don't jump to hasty conclusions when you have to explain things about uh, Creoles. And uh, Anegre, uh, you have always been very generous. I'm grateful to have received some um, volumes of your etymological dictionary that you had sent to me by your assistant. And a student of mine working on the fusion of the article and noun in Indian Ocean fields found your dictionary very, very helpful. So now I'm going to switch to something uh, that I hope will not embarrass you because I saw you for the last time before this, this uh, uh, virtual uh, meeting uh, in Aix-en-Provence and uh, you were giving a plenary and uh, toward the end you giggled and blushed. And uh, <laughs> this was in relation to sailors traveling around Africa 
and sharing um, female partners, not concurrently, <laughs> but you know, at different times because they didn't all travel at the same time. And I don't know why you blushed, but I thought it was something that was revealing about the human aspect of colonization. And that one actually motivated me to read more stories about the colonial expeditions. And now I'm going to tell you what I have found. That when you put colonization in economic context, and you also situate trade colonization in the global context of what we call globalization today. You realize very quickly that the trade couldn't have proceeded in the way that we have always assumed in theoristics. But there were practical concerns, like people didn't just sail and stop somewhere at some convenient place in Africa and ask if they could buy ivory or gold or slaves. It couldn't work that way because the non-European rulers were not stupid anyway <laughs> to engage in transactions in the way that we have usually explained. And you look at the map of African kingdoms and empires during that time, the capital city is usually in the interior. And you read that history very carefully, Africa was long connected to the rest of the world before Western Europeans became connected with it because they were engaged in trade with the Arabs. But what also happened is that when Europeans arrived, they depended on local traders who became auxiliaries in the trade. The biggest challenge is how they initiated the first contacts, but they often stay on the coast for months waiting for opportunities to receive goods from the interior. What happened during that time? The form unions with African women or in Asia that happened too. <laughs> Uh, uh, where you, uh, uh, and it, it was initially the Portuguese who did it. It, it was 150 years after the Portuguese that the French, uh, the, uh, the English and the Dutch engaged in trade, which enabled Portuguese to become the lingua franca of trade all over the coast, around the coast of Africa, and, and all the way to China. And this is particularly interesting. And in reading this history, I discovered the presence of women known as signats uh, in Saint Louis, in Boré. There are counterparts uh, of these women in Guinea Bissau. And Little by little, and these signals were merchants, but they needed to connect with the European traders. And the people they met were representatives of mercantile companies. So that's why we hear about Dutch East India Company, French East India Company, and the British East India, India Company, and so forth. But while they were on the coast, they made it, they formed unions, and some even have marriage certificates. But the marriage certificates were signed in such a way that since life expectancy was short, if the man died, the woman or returned to Europe for a long time, the woman could remarry, which explained what I may great drew our attention to that very often these sailors or merchants or representatives of companies share the same partners. But when you put things in perspective, ah, learning language by immersion. 
Europeans that learn to speak African languages by immersion, but the children of from these unions who spoke European languages as a, 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 a mother tongue. No wonder we don't hear about French pigeons in the places where the French um, um, set, set, uh, um, set uh, trade colonies, uh, first because they confiscated uh, the trade fortification from the Portuguese, and but they inherited Portuguese as a trade language, but second, because there were these mulatto children who, when they grew up, became important trade auxiliaries because they are the ones that went in the interior and traded and came back. There is another reason. They needed to survive on a diet that was local. And that really meant connecting very well with the locals on the coast. And again, we are dealing here with immersion in society and learning the local languages and the people that they form partnerships with played an important role in um, uh, 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 mediating between the people who could sell the goods in this trade and the buyers. When you put things in perspective, it's not just any African who could show up and see a European say, here, I have a trade, a, a slave, would you buy him? Or here, I have a piece of ivory, would you buy it? Or here, I have a chunk of gold, would you buy it? You know, it was people who could secure these commodities among the Africans and elsewhere you just substitute another word, another ethnicity for Africa. And then you have the representatives of the mercantile companies and so forth. And trade was proceeding in such a way that nobody could really resort to a broken language to exchange such expensive commodities. And the story gets more interesting because when you have to sail in the Indian Ocean, you have to pay attention to the monsoon seasons. And people couldn't sail all year round. If within six months you go east and during the next six months you sail west. And people were stationed somewhere and so forth you get an interesting picture of how Portuguese Creoles evolved in South, in South um, Asia and, uh, and East Asia, because these people, they had to form partnerships with the locals. And in the case of Asia, Clancy Clements is here, you can contradict me. They got into situation where these one particular ethnic group would form partnership with the uh, uh, Portuguese and new ethnic groups emerged that Christianized, I adopted part of Portuguese culture and adopted the Portuguese language and so forth. If you factor in the fact that it was informal Portuguese, well, Shaman linguists would jump to the conclusion that it must be a Creole because the new speakers are non-Europeans. But anyway, there you get another idea. And then you go to China in Guangzhou. I'm going to be very short, I'm almost done. Yes, thanks a lot. Yeah, and there too you come across these situations where people just had to, in China, an interpreter was required in order to trade with the natives, but also people had to wait. They were subject to the monsoon season too. And there you read about the traders forming unions with local women and so forth. No wonder we have Nakanese Creole or whatever you want to call it. This is a very interesting thing. And I'm going to complete, uh, 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 complement uh, your story, Anikir, by saying 
there are two important human factors that we have to consider in trade colonization and the emergence of pigeons, food and sex. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Sally. Thank you so much. Now we have our fourth speaker. It's Penda Shopi from the Seychelles. Please go ahead, Penda. Thank you. Uh, okay, let's see. Um, I'm uh, not going to, I'm just going to speak uh, like uh, Sally. Perfect. Okay, so. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say thank you for choosing me to be part of this very uh, wonderful ceremony. I'm so uh, honored. Uh, okay, so I first met Annie Gret Bollet in 1999 when I had just become the director of the Creole Institute of Seychelles. And at that time, I had just returned from my first uh, SIEC uh, colloquium. Uh, in Aix-en-Provence, which was held in March, I, I believe. And Anne was on one of her annual visits to Seychelles, and naturally she came to visit the Creole Institute. I eagerly told her about my desire to organize a Creole colloquium in Seychelles in the same year as part of the Creole festival activities in October. But how are you going to do it, she asked. You don't know anyone yet, do you? Now, that might sound like a dampening remark, but it made me realize the importance of networking. So I went back to the emails which had been sent during the organization of the SIEC colloquium and picked out some which I had established a rapport with and others which I thought might be helpful in the conception of my first Creole colloquium. One of those people was Vinash Hukumsi, who more or less masterminded the October 1999 colloquium in Seychelles. Anigret came back for this colloquium. This is a colloquium like any other, she said. And I understood that she meant it was as good a colloquium as any she had been to. One of my most cherished memories is her standing with me on the steps of the Creole Institute building waving off the colloquium participants after the closing ceremony. She was uh, waving her handkerchief, a little bit like a film star, I thought. <laughs> um, now, uh, other people in Seychelles who have been in close contact with Anigret have similar stories to tell, like our dear departed Marcel Rosali, who told me about the first time he went to Germany with Anigret, where he really learned how to do academic work. But the funniest one is from an ex-Creole Institute staff member who is now the CEO of a cultural agency in Seychelles. He told me how, as a young A-level graduate, he had produced his first written project and was told by the then director, Marie-Thérèse Chopi, to show it to Annegret Bollet, who was around at the time. She just demolished it, he said. So he went crying to the director who told him that Anigret was perfectly right. This means that you have to go back to the drawing board and try again, he was told. So he did. And as Anigret happened to come to Seychelles fairly often at the time, the next time she came back to the institute, he reluctantly showed her the results of his second attempt. This is much better, she told him. <laughs> I felt so proud, he told me. And from that day on, I was very conscious of the quality of my work. Now, these are not just anecdotes. They are testimonies of how Annegret Bolle, once she had committed to Seychelles as her field of study, had the best interests of the country and its people at heart. This is not often the case in the North-South relationship of academia. The contrary, contrary is only too often the reverse where the subjects of study are only just that, subjects of study, and the means of achieving academic goals. In Seychelles, Anikat works with, with people and not on them. For even now, she, even remotely, she's still doing it. In so doing, she has left a legacy of which I am now going to point out uh, a few. 
uh, one, a codification of the Seychelles Creole orthography with Daniel Dauphé, resulting in one of the first, uh, first proper linguistic descriptions of the language uh, through their works entitled Le Creole Francais des Seychelles, Espice d'une grammaire, text vocabulaire. And also, Apprenant la nouvelle orthographe, proposition uh, d'une orthographe rationnelle pour le Creole des Seychelles avec six contes Creole Seychellois. These works are the basis of the standardization of the Seychelles Creole orthography, which has permitted the country to push through its avant-garde Creole reforms in education and in the public service since the 1980s. The exploration of uh, Seychelles Creole folk tales uh, and Reci de Vie, which uh, resulted in a book of uh, Creole folk tales, Tiana et Foi et Sumbula, Creole stories from the Seychelles uh, and Parole et Mémoire, Récit de Vie des Seychelles, uh, in collaboration with Marcel Rosalie and Gabriel Isaac. Um, and uh, also um, uh, um, her translation of Rodolphine Young's uh, translation of Les Femmes de la Fontaine. Uh, these have formed the basis of further linguistic explorations and other types of research on Seychelles Creole. The editing of the first Seychelles Creole Dictionary by Daniel Dauphé and Guillaume in 1982, followed by a second edition in 1999. The entries for this dictionary have formed the basis of the current lexical database maintained by the Creole Institute for all its language tool development projects, inclusive of an ongoing monolingual dictionary and a Creole spell check. The Dictionnaire Etymologique des Creoles Français de l'Océan Indien, which is also a very useful research tool. Now, these are only uh, a few. So these works, along with many others which she has published with other researchers, are the cornerstones of reference for anybody working on Seychellois Creole, especially in the field of language and linguistics. Besides this, Annegret has produced many other documents that trace the history of language development in Seychelles, and a lot of them uh, during her many appearances at important commemorative events in the context of Creole development in the country. For example, the commemoration of the 25th anniversary of the Creole Institute in 2012, where she made a presentation. She was also the guest of honor. Annegret uh, Bole, or Anna, as she is uh, fondly referred to, uh, has not maintained a monopoly of Creole studies in Seychelles, but has rather engaged other researchers, most of them her past students in different types of research projects. Today, we have a strong contingent of linguists who have worked on Seychelles Creole and who are continuing to work alongside Seychelles nationals and institutions for the greater benefit of SC. I personally think of them at the school of Bole, though this might be disputed by some. Among these are Susan Michaelis, Sibyl uh, Krigel, and Ingrid Newman, whom I have personally worked with or whose work and collaboration have been so far invaluable to me and to others. Let me end with a last important anecdote. My remembrance of the 14th Siek Colloquium, once again in X. I was next in line to present in a room with barely five people present. Five minutes before my predecessor's presentation ended, the door opened and people started filing in, preceded by a strong school of Bole contingent. La cavalerie arrive, Annegret chuckled as she sat down behind me. Most of my nervousness evaporated and I went on to make what I believe was a good presentation. This kind of support from Annegret and her colleagues is symbolical of their relationship with Seychelles, not just providing useful criticism and references, not just guiding, participating and collaborating, but also building meaningful and emotional relationships. In short, becoming family. For this, I would like on behalf of Seychelles to, to thank Annegret from the bottom of my heart. Thank you. Thank you. 
help. And uh, thank you so much for this contribution. Welcome. <laughs> thank you so much. Oh, wow. Now, Annegret, it's time that we uh, take our glasses and toast to you. I know that there must be glasses in your room. That is Martin Hase is the one who will... And I have a little rosé. Ah, right. First of all, it's the bouquet. That's it, exactly. You get a nice bouquet of flowers because, uh, you know, the COVID, COVID crisis can, you know, separate us here. But still, you get your flowers, Annegret. Here they go. Congratulations from the whole SPCL family, Annegret, to you. Oh, they are lovely. <laughs> Thank you. Mm, tall and now we just take whoever wants to take i wrote it to some people i have a, a little one here sip just to toast to you and um yes thank you again now uh martin is opening the bottle ah zibilla too you've got some so my dears just grab whatever you have perfect tea coffee water it doesn't matter put on your put on your cameras if you want to as much as you can that would be great to have you all here. Elisabeth Montfort, Annegret is auch here. Elisabeth, <laughs> oh, super. Thanks so much again. And um, yes, uh, the, the joint SPCL congratulations uh, for this special day for you, Annegret. Wie weit seid ihr? Ja, los, hier, Prost, Annegret. Prost, 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 Prost. Vielen Dank, many thanks to contributors. Yes, thanks. And with this, I'm happy to, 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 give my, uh, to give the floor back to Bettina Migge, the president of the SPCL. Yeah, I Bettina, can, can, I, can I say something? Uh, sure, go ahead oh. and say something first. Yeah, yeah Annika Bollet, uh, she is actually the recipient of the Lifetime Award in 2020. So since we couldn't do it because we didn't have the organizational skills, unfortunately, to uh, organize a meeting last summer, she got a, a, she got a, uh, a placard anyway. She got, a, and uh, so that was sent to her. She has that uh, and is probably hanging somewhere on her wall. Yes, it, it's in my study on the wall. I should have brought it to show it to everybody, but I didn't think of that. Sorry. That's no problem at all. May Thanks I very say, much. May I say a word of thanks? Sure. Go ahead, please. Well, I'm deeply moved by this award and extremely grateful to the Society of Pidgin and Creole Langu Linguistics. And I'd like to thank all of those with whom I shared the pleasure of studying Creoles. This would take too much time. I'll only thank the four friends who honored me with their tributes this afternoon. Dear Susanna, thank you for the wonderful years when we worked side by side at the University of Bamberg. And I'm very proud that you invited me to become a member of the APEX Consortium. And I'm proud that I could make a contribution to this wonderful, to this outstanding achievement of Creole studies. Thank you so much for everything and for the <clears throat> honor you, for the tribute you made today, which really moved me. Dear Sibylle, please <clears throat> pass on my sincere thanks to all the friends at Aix-en-Provence and thank you for your wonderful contribution this afternoon. <laughs> you reminded me of so many happy moments we spent together. Thank you so much. Sally Coco, I thank you personally, but I also thank you because you are a member of the Comité International des Études Creole, of which I am one of the founding mothers. And the Comité International deserves my thanks for encouraging me to undertake, especially uh, the encouragement of um, <coughs> Robert Chaudanson, to undertake the Dictionnaire Etymologique des Creoles Français, which became Decoy and Deca, which have been mentioned today. And they also encouraged me to start the series Creolische Bibliothek. Uh, many of the authors have become close friends of mine, and I'm very happy to see here um, 
Ralf Flutwig and um, Evelyn Wiesinger, Ingrid Neumann is on sea somewhere near Stockholm. She cannot be with us this afternoon. And I'm glad that they will take the direction of this series now so that it can go on. And dear Penda, you represent the best part of my life, the most happy the work which I've done in the Seychelles and the many friends um, and to whom I owe thanks, uh, also those who are no longer with us, Daniel de Saint-Jean, Guy Lyonnais and Marcel Rosalie. I am very happy and very proud that I could contribute to make Creole a written language and to convince the Seychellois that their language is a, <laughs> that their Creole is a language by writing a grammar and publishing it. So thank you, Penda, and thank the Seychelles. They are really the center of my life. I can no longer go there, uh, but I, my heart is still going around the beaches and at the Institut Creole and with all the friends I'm still in, in touch. Thank you to everybody. I am deeply moved by this. Thank you. You can just give, unmute yourself so that we can hear. You can unmute yourself so that we hear your clapping. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Sally Cooker, did you want to say something? Because your hand is raised, that's why I'm asking. We can't hear you. <laughs> no, I didn't plan to, I didn't uh, want to say okay. anything. Okay, I just wanted to ask. Well, um, Thanks so much for um, Susanna for organizing this great event and for the great speakers. I'm really happy that we managed to do it despite uh, this virtual um, stuff, which is always only half as good as the real um, event. But um, on behalf of the Society for Pigeon and Creole Linguistics, well, it's a bit weird that I'm saying that, but I want to <laughs> thank the organizers for organizing this event. But uh, although I was part of this, I, we really need to thank um, Stefano because he really did the bulk of the work uh, for this event. So maybe a round of applause for Stefano as well. Oh. Thank you, everyone. No, he's still there. That's great. I'm here. So no, that was fabulously organized and it all worked really well. Uh, and the conditions of organizing was weren't as uh, as great as we would have imagined them. So yeah, I I think we can all stay on on the link and chat um, if you want to. That's absolutely fine. But I think I can formally end um, uh, the event now. And just to say that we have decided that there will be an event in January, and we're still debating whether it will be. Um, exactly when the society of uh, when the society uh, linguistic society of america meets or whether it'll be slightly different but it will be another virtual event because i think nobody really sees um that we can go uh, face to face so thanks again to everybody for for meeting and heal so soon from us bye bye bye